Every time any one of us goes to the doctor, collects a prescription, signs up to a fitness regime, or just buys some headache tablets, that information is recorded. The NHS digitally monitors hospital diagnosis, conditions and pharmacy records. We're building a more accurate picture of the nation's health faster than ever before. As a GP, I know that different times of the year bring different complaints through my surgery door. So what if we looked at all the data for the entire country? What would that say about our health as a nation? To find out, I'm getting out and about. Any shenanigans? Did anyone have any exciting encounters with anybody else? Swapping my surgery for school. Oh, she's got some around her nose now. Oh, yes. And I'm going way beyond the call of duty. Oh, they're biting me, James. Oh, James. Oh, my God. James. James. If we had a good idea of when we're going to get food poisoning, flu or muscle strain, then could we prevent getting the same problems year on year? From reducing your risk of strokes and heart attacks to avoiding potentially fatal accidents. I'm going to look back at what we caught when in 2016 to find out what we can do to keep ourselves fit and healthy for the year ahead. January 2016 spelled stomach trouble right across the UK. In England alone, almost 100,000 saw their doctor for gastroenteritis, but we should spare a thought for the six people who, whilst abroad, contracted malaria and the one who caught typhoid. But as the new year began, many of us were suffering from a self-inflicted condition. Lots of us overindulged during the festive season, binging on food and booze. And while there is definitely a pace for partying in our lives, come January, most of us tend to feel a bit toxic. And there's one campaign that's transformed the start of the year. Dry January started four years ago, and it's already a social phenomenon. In 2016, 10 million people attempted to stay dry for the month. Just goes to show we know alcohol isn't good for us, but are we really sure about what it's doing to our bodies? I've decided I'm going to do my own dry month to find out. But before going booze-free, I'm visiting liver specialist Dr Gautam Mehta. So what does drinking really do to your liver? OK. Great. It's on this side, isn't it? I think so. Yeah? I think so. <laughs> um, that's good. It's cold jelly going on, all right? Uh, so let's see what we, what we find, eh? God, I'm getting a bit nervous now, actually. <laughs> the more we drink, the stiffer and more inflamed our liver becomes, increasing the risk of permanent liver damage and even cancer. So here, a low number, means that your liver is nice and soft. A normal liver should just be like a jelly on a plate. When that number goes a bit higher, then that suggests that there's a bit of inflammation or scarring. It's that bit firmer. OK. You know, like a panna cotta in a restaurant. You right. Know? Um, Do you like a panna cotta? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a liver in good shape should have a score under seven. Higher than that indicates problems. Right, we're done. So, 6.0. Which is, right. which is fine, I'll, yeah, that's right. which is fine. There is evidence time off booze improves liver health. But with more than 9 million people in England alone drinking more than the recommended weekly limit, could going dry for a month really make a difference to the nation's health? You OK with needles? Hate them. I've recruited these beer, wine and spirit-loving volunteers to kick the booze with me. We'll reveal the results at the end of our look back at 2016. GPs like me know exactly what to expect in January. And last year was no exception. In the first month of the year, we saw 80,000 people a week in England because they had a cold. Now, there are over 200 different types of virus that can cause the common cold. And the chilly weather tends to help them circulate. But something else happens in January that helps spread these germs around. This lot go back to school. <laughs> Professor Wendy Barclay is a leading expert on winter bugs. And together, we're going to show why children keep cold viruses in business. 
kids are outside having their lunch and Wendy and the team are spreading germs around the reception classroom. Our germs are a harmless concoction of liquid and gloopy stuff. The consistency of snot. When we sneeze, we eject up to 40,000 droplets of liquid, mucus, viruses and bacteria, spreading as far as eight metres. We're trying to recreate an authentic, invisible sneeze. And the key thing with this is it glows under ultraviolet light. So the plan is, the kids will come back in, they'll do their thing, and then we'll be able to see just where our little outbreak has ended up. Children are far more tactile and relaxed about personal space and hygiene than your average adult. It's this natural behaviour that makes them the perfect virus spreading machines. <laughs> you think about our behaviour, we might have our own pen and our own mobile phone, but we don't necessarily pass those yeah, yeah. things around. A UV torch gives a glimpse that our germs are spreading. But after two hours play, filming the kids under UV light reveals just how many little hands are contaminated. Back in the classroom, we can see what happens next. Nice little melting pot. Oh, she put a hand in her mouth. <laughs> if they've got some of this um, mucus on their hands and then they're going to touch their eyes, their nose, or directly hands into the mouth, all of those could be routes in for the virus. Cold viruses can survive on hands for up to an hour and on hard surfaces for up to 24 hours. But the moment viruses find a way into the body, they start multiplying. And the kids will bring their cold home to the rest of us. Oh, she's oh. got some around her nose, Liv. Oh, yes, and on her face. Her nose, oh, nostrils. right, the direct inoculation into the nostrils. Every year, the school calendar reliably predicts cold outbreaks. And though it's not rocket science, there's only one way to stop the spread. Dip your hands in your water and let's start. Wash, wash, wash. Given up to 13,000 hours of GP time was spent on colds each week over winter, it's not only the kids that need a hand-washing lesson. As adults, we like to think we're all fairly hygienic. We don't get too close to others in terms of personal contact and we don't stick our fingers up our nose. But one in ten of us don't actually wash our hands after we've been to the toilet. One in four don't bother to wash our hands before we eat. And 50% of us never wash after we've blown our nose or sneezed. So while we'd like to blame the kids, actually, as adults, we really need to try harder. By March, we'd normally expect to be getting over our winter sniffles. And we'd usually see a pattern a bit like this. Flu, for example, usually peaks in December and January, but then tails off as the weather gradually improves. But in 2016, we saw a strange flu surge in March. I'm meeting Wendy down on the farm to find out more. It's a real battle against flu. The virus circulates every year. People then who get infected become naturally immune and that produces pressure on the virus to change. So because of that, we have to change the vaccine that we give to people every year. The World Health Organization advises the NHS on which flu strains to vaccinate against each year. In 2016, the main strain we caught was swine flu. The virus swine flu was a sort of mixture of lots of viruses from pigs and humans and ducks that had all managed to combine together. And that particular virus was able to jump across from pigs into humans. Swine flu first appeared in 2009 and it spread very rapidly around the world to become one of only five global flu pandemics in the last century. Since then, we've built up immunity and developed a vaccine to prevent it. So doctors weren't worried that it was doing the rounds in 2016, but they were surprised how late in spring it arrived. It could be something to do with the other viruses which are going around, as there are lots of different viruses which can infect our respiratory tracts and make us ill, and it's almost like a competition for them. Who gets in there first? Ah, so you might have a cold now, so the flu will do its circuit and then come back and Get nab you. you. So how do you know if you ended up with swine flu or just a cold in spring 2016? 
Symptoms of cold and flu are similar. Runny nose, cough, sore throat. But if you've got the flu, these tend to come on much faster. You tend to have a temperature of between 38 and 40, generalized aches and pains, sweating. And if you're feeling really exhausted, you have probably been unlucky. If you've caught the flu, stay in bed and don't spread it. Swine flu wasn't the only thing doing the rounds. In just one week in March, there were more than 1,300 new cases of scarlet fever, a bacterial illness that causes a distinctive pink-red rash. This is the highest weekly total since 1982. Perhaps it's the toll of all the nasty bugs, but by March, 80% of us will have ditched our New Year's resolutions. Gym fees went down the drain, self-help books gathered dust, and weight loss was what most of us tried, but failed to do. Around one in four adults in the UK are obese, and one in five children are obese by the age of 10. And it's costing the country a staggering 27 billion pounds a year. In March 2016, for the first time ever, the Chancellor stepped in. I can announce that we will introduce a new <coughs> sugar levy on the soft drinks industry. From 2018, drinks containing more than five grams of added sugar per 100 mil will cost 18p more per litre. <laughs> Eight grams of added sugar per 100 mils and a litre will cost an extra 24p. By hiking the prices, the hope is that the companies will reduce the sugar in order to become more competitive. And quite frankly, this can't happen soon enough because the sugar levels in some of these drinks are astonishing. Cola drinks pile it in with up to 10 teaspoons of sugar per can. Cloudy lemon drinks add up to 11. And among the worst offenders are premium ginger beers, with a can smuggling up to 13 teaspoons of sugar. The fact is, we know that we're indulging if we choose to eat chocolate bars, biscuits or cake. But sugary drinks go down quickly, easily and frequently and they don't even dent our hunger. So sugary drinks are out and we probably should cut down on cakes too. Could anything that delivers a sweet fix ever be good for our health? One answer could be chocolate. It's got to be over 70% cocoa. That's the bit researchers tell us has fringe benefits. Of all the many claims made for dark chocolate, the most convincing is that flavanols, found in high cocoa products, can help reduce your blood pressure. So surely, that's a reason to celebrate. Come April, we were finally filled with the joys of spring. But for one in four Brits, as the weather warmed and the flowers bloomed, the sneezing began. In 2016, GP appointments for hay fever peaked a few weeks earlier than usual. Hay fever season starts when trees and grasses begin releasing their pollen. And experts predict that climate change will lengthen the season in Britain, meaning in the future, the sneezing may start earlier and end later. But there's another regular springtime fixture that comes around like clockwork that none of us can escape. Whether we liked it or not, when the clock sprung forward an hour at the end of March, we all lost an hour's sleep. For most of us, getting up an hour early means little more than we're going to be grumpier during the day. But recent scientific research has shown an 8% increase in the number of strokes in the two days after the clock has changed. So why are some of us hit harder than others because of the clock change in spring? I'm meeting Professor Russell Foster, a world-leading expert on sleep, for an after-dark chat. So, Russell, tell me what exactly happens to us when the clocks change? We're being forced out of bed when our body is not prepared for it. But in addition, most of us are sleep-deprived. So we've shortened our sleep even further. That hour, actually, has, has got a big impact, doesn't it? Yeah, there's a blip in the accident rate. There's a whole range of other sort of emotional problems that have been reported about that sort of destabilizing impact of that, just that single hour. 
Around half of Brits don't get enough sleep, which means a lot of us will really feel it when the clocks go forward, particularly the more than three million of us who work at night. I've been working nights for six months now. It's a lot harder than working a day shift, especially with your eating habits. Difficult to sleep during the day, so it is tough. Ray Shiavi is a chef at one of London's bustling 24-hour haunts. It's about about seven in the morning. I wake up about 12, one o'clock. Uh, unless the neighbours got the builders in, then I get up early. All the dogs are barking. All the dustmen come. That's where the coffee comes in. I've done the night shift um, as a junior doctor, and I found it awful. So. Lack of sleep, what's it really doing to me? Even after a few days of loss of sleep or sleep disruption, you see that ability to process information is impaired. There's longer term consequences, the sort of thing that you would see in long term night shift work, and that's the big stuff. Higher rates of cardiovascular disease, infection, in some cases, a greater risk of cancer. Diabetes, too, is very common in night shift workers. It's interesting because I suppose as a doctor, while we ask questions about sleep, clearly it should be up there with all the other yeah. risk factors. I think we've really got to embed in our healthcare systems an understanding of the importance of sleep and why we need to prioritise it. Sleep deprivation is the second most common health complaint in the UK. Many of us, myself included, don't get enough sleep and that can have really serious consequences. So what we need to do is get to bed on time, ditch that extra shot of the coffee in the morning and go out and enjoy first light because that's the natural way to wake your brain up for the day. When any of us take a trip to the doctor, we usually walk away with a prescription for something. The most recent data revealed that in just one year, an astonishing one billion prescription items were dispensed in England alone. I've collected data from across the UK to reveal the top three ailments. In third place, a treatment for underactive thyroid. In second place, it's an acid reflux or heartburn medicine. But top of the list is a statin, a pill designed to reduce the level of cholesterol in your blood. Dealing with cholesterol is a big part of a doctor's workload, and I write an awful lot of prescriptions for statins. In May of this year, two new cholesterol-lowering drugs were approved. Question is, do most of us even know who should be thinking about their cholesterol? I've enlisted a little help to find out. These guys are all different ages, body types and weights. So, who's at risk? I think this, this guy here for me. <laughs> Maybe gentleman over here. Why is that? Maybe because his body is a little bit bigger than okay. everybody around him. This fella on the right. He's getting a hard time today. Yeah. Why are you picking on him? Everyone's picking um, on him. He's carrying more weight than the others. Okay. I have to let you in a secret. All of these guys have perfectly healthy cholesterol levels. What my little test shows is that most people think we only have to consider cholesterol if we're middle-aged and carrying extra weight. And as a GP, this worries me because actually over half of all adults in England have raised cholesterol. You simply can't tell who they are just by looking. If you want to know for sure, you've got to take a test. We're running a pop-up clinic so people in the street can find out for themselves. Smoke. So, if he's a non-smoker and has normal cholesterol, and you're a smoker and you have high cholesterol, you're much higher up the risk factor scales for heart disease and stroke than he is. It's important to know your numbers. Just living a more healthy lifestyle, stopping smoking, drinking less, and exercising more can all help. If your overall cholesterol levels are high, then you need to do something about it. Statins work by affecting the liver and reducing the total amount of cholesterol in your bloodstream. And diet can also be really useful in lowering your score. There's great evidence that a Mediterranean-style diet, rich in vegetables, fruit, grains, and lean meat, 
can actually increase your levels of good cholesterol and reduce overall risk of developing heart disease. May saw a mini heat wave. The UK was hotter than Ibiza as the mercury hit 27 degrees and admissions to A&E for heat stroke spiked. But there's another spring spike that happens year on year and 2016 was no different. From the seemingly harmless pursuits of DIY and gardening, we see over 20,000 people attending A&E nationwide. As May turned to June, there was another annual fixture that hit the headlines for something more than just the star performers and the mud. In 2016, what made the news at festivals was measles. When there are shocking health stories in the news, there's one man who can make sense of it all. Professor Sir David Spiegelhalter, the UK's leading expert on understanding risk. So David, tell me about this measles story. This is the thing for you that's stood out in terms of the headlines. Yes, and this is really extraordinary. It's about the fact that in the first half of this year, there were four times as many measles cases reported. And a huge batch then occurred in the summer festivals. There were 16 measles cases in Glastonbury alone. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think this is very important because in a sense, measles just shouldn't occur. Measles is caused by a virus that up until the 1960s could kill up to 100 people in the UK in a single year. In 1968, a vaccine was introduced, which caused numbers to drop dramatically. So what happened this year? Measles is incredibly infectious. People have calculated that if, if you've got measles and you walk into a tent with 100 people who haven't got measles, you're likely to infect about 90 of them, seven of them very seriously indeed. And the point is that these kids who went to the festival and got measles, they're not just any old kids. If you think backwards, they were born in the late 1990s. And mm -hmm. Remember, this was the time when there was a claimed link between the measles vaccine and autism. And so many people didn't vaccinate their kids at that time. And of course, they're growing up yes. and now getting together in groups at things like festivals. We know now that there is no proof whatsoever of a link between the measles vaccine, called MMR, and autism. But because of this claim, vaccination rates plummeted in some parts of the country to below 80%. Really, we need 90, 95% of the population to be vaccinated, more than for any, any other disease. Presumably, because it's so infectious, it becomes a much more significant global problem, doesn't it? A disease like measles will go around the world in no time at all, if, if people are unprotected. That's a real worry. Hmm. Vaccine uptake in parts of England is still below the 95% target needed to stop these very dangerous outbreaks. In the case of measles and the outbreaks this year, we really need to be paying attention to the headlines because it's down to us if it happens again next year. So whatever your age, if you've missed out, remember, it's never too late to go and get vaccinated. Summer 2016 fully arrived in July, when temperatures soared into the 30s for the first time across the UK. And you know what? We did what we always do. GPs and hospitals saw a surge in cases of heat stroke. And if you look online and see how many people searched sunburn, there was a huge increase in mid-July. Sunburn is really serious. One single episode before the age of 20 can as much as double your lifetime risk of getting the deadliest form of skin cancer, melanoma. So do yourself a favor, get some sunscreen and make sure it has a high SPF on the front and a high UVA rating on the back. But there was something in the news this summer that really took everyone, doctors included, by surprise. Up until 2016, I'd never even heard of the Zika virus. But an outbreak in the lead up to the Rio Olympics in August meant that it hit the headlines. Here was a virus that could be caught from mosquitoes, passed on sexually, and could potentially damage the brains of unborn babies. And as of yet, there was no treatment. Many athletes chose not to go to the Olympics, and some who went elected to freeze their sperm. And at the time, none of us really knew how worried we should be. 
Dr. James Logan advised the UK government and Team GB on Zika. He's based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where he runs a rather unusual laboratory. We've got loads of mosquitoes here in the UK, but we don't have the ones that are called Aedes mosquitoes that transmit Zika. We do have some here, though, in our lab, of course you under do. You know, strict <laughs> security measures. The thing about Zika is that there is no vaccine. There's no preventative. The best way that you can stop yourself getting the virus is through stopping the mosquito from biting you. We don't think that the transmission through sexual activity is very high. The biggie is the mosquito. So just one simple bite? One bite is enough, yeah. About 10% of the population are naturally unappealing to mosquitoes. So for James, the ultimate goal is to develop a holiday pill to make us all like this. I even thought I might be one of the lucky few, as I never seem to get bitten much. So we decided to put it to the test. This is a hungry cage of mosquitoes, and you can see them already actually starting to respond to our breath, because we're sat quite close to them. I think they're trying to get out. I think they are trying to get out, yeah. But I think we should try you out. So stick your hand in. And we're going to wait for about 30 seconds. Oh, ah! my God! Oh, my God. Good, good. Oh, oh, they're biting me, James. Oh, James. Oh, my God. James. James. I have never seen such an immediate reaction. James. That is crazy. Am I a freak? I'm really unattractive yeah, freak. Take, take your arm out. Take your arm out. Ooh. Shake, shake it. Give it a shake. Give it a shake. That is crazy. They love you. Oh, I'm flattered. <laughs> I genuinely have never seen a reaction like that by the mosquitoes. <laughs> I'm, and I'm not kidding. I'm a freak of you nature. You are. Having established I'm actually irresistible to mosquitoes, repellents suddenly seem a lot more appealing. If I'm going in there again, right, I want something strong. I'm trying to teach you something about the repellents. <laughs> OK, so, so you want the strong one. Shall we try the 50% DEET? Let's go for the 50% DEET. A lot of people don't like to use this stuff because um, they think it's unsafe. Patients always say that. Mm. They're anxious about it, yeah. Yeah, but actually, uh, that's not true. Um, it is safe. The concentration you should use it in is between 20 and 50%. OK. little hand massage. There we are. Right, let's see if it actually works. Oh, this would be a great laugh. Mm. Just don't let them out at me. If you don't want to do this... Nap the face. Let's see how many bites you get this time. Arrgh. Hi, mozzies. Right. OK. I'm back again. Oh, look at that. <gasps> look at that. Wow. One landed and took off. But not one has landed and, and fed. There we go. So they're just not liking it at all. That's good. Yeah. Like this. So, I mean, there's your proof. Yeah. This stuff works. This stuff is really, really good. Zika is a real concern, but mosquitoes carry a host of diseases like malaria and dengue that kill several million people worldwide each year. Data from James's team has revealed that a shocking 74% of us don't take repellents when we travel to tropical destinations. And you can forget marmite, garlic or taking vitamins because they simply don't stop us getting bitten. If applied properly, repellents like DEET or lemon eucalyptus will protect you and are safe. Up until today, mosquito repellent would never feature on my list of holiday must-haves, but from now on, it's definitely going on. As summer progressed, there's one seasonal invite pretty much all of us will have received. The moment the sun comes out, there's one thing you're almost guaranteed. We fire up the great British barbecue. But with that comes food poisoning, the rates of which almost double during the summer months. But in 2016, there was something in our burger buns that was a real cause for concern. Professor Val Edwards-Jones is a microbiologist. While most of us try to avoid nasty bugs, she grows them for a living and has quite a collection. This is a lovely spread, but I'm kind of guessing, because it's stationed in a lab, yeah. that this is not my supper. No, it isn't. I certainly wouldn't let you eat in a lab. Her latest samples from summer 2016 can make you really sick. The really interesting story has been to do with the mixed salad. OK. Bags of salad contaminated by E. coli 0157, which is a particularly nasty 
food poisoning bug. And that's got into the salad through... It will have probably been something to do with the soil that it was growing in. It's become contaminated by animal feces. Data from Public Health England confirmed an outbreak in July and August of E. coli 0157, linked to salad leaves. It affected over 160 people across Britain. But the particular type 0157 carries a toxin. And when you ingest contaminated food with this bug, it causes very nasty abdominal pain. You get really bad bloody diarrhea. And if it's left untreated or in some very unfortunate individuals, it can be fatal. Should we be washing prepped salad then? The manufacturers say no, because they are washed and they are washed thoroughly. Most of them, I must stress, are absolutely fine and they have under very strict scrutiny from food manufacturers. It's just some occasionally yeah. something... Something goes wrong. Goes wrong. This was a rare kind of food poisoning. But if you want to be sure your salad is bug free all year round, just give it a good wash. In 2016, a lot of us opted for a summer staycation. But when we're enjoying the seaside, there are some risks we really ought to be more aware of. This summer, there were many news stories about accidents in the water around the British Isles. And it's no surprise that these peak at this time of the year. But the reasons why may not be quite what you expect. Professor Mike Tipton and his colleagues are based at the University of Portsmouth Extreme Environment Laboratory. They can demonstrate the shocking dangers of cold water. But it calls for some tough volunteers. Joel, Andy and Connor are incredibly fit, healthy and strong swimmers. But the fact is, two-thirds of coastal fatalities are in guys like them. How cold is the water? The water's at 12 degrees Celsius, so... Um, yeah, it's, it's the average water temperature around the British Isles over the course of the year. So it's going to be freezing, is what you're saying. Um, it'll be, it'll be uh, exciting. The team are going to plunge all three guys into very cold water. We'll be carefully monitoring their heart rate and breathing, because no matter how strong they are, these can change dramatically. You ready? This is going to be a 20 minutes, 12 degree water immersion. I'll give you a five second countdown, then take a slightly larger than normal breath in, hold it as long as you can. Five, four, three, two, one. Breath hold. <laughs> Before hitting the water, the guys could hold their breath for well over a minute. But once they're in, Connor holds on for just 12 seconds. Well done. That's good effort. Joel holds out for 20. OK, that's good stuff. Andy somehow manages 30 seconds. That was nearly not very much, wasn't it? <laughs> Did you feel your muscles contracting, trying to make you breathe? Yeah, nearly went and then I just held it in. <sighs> it doesn't matter how well these guys can swim. This response, called cold water shock, causes uncontrolled breathing, increasing the chances of taking water into your lungs. And the strain on the heart is enormous too. We've just seen about 125, 130 beats per minute, which is why some people um, less fit than you are, have a, have a heart problem at that stage. Next stop is a warm bath for the guys to recover their fighting strength. Is it worse than getting a smack in the face from your worst worse. rival? Punches are easy. Friend in the water there is not great. No, I wouldn't do it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I thought you brought your swimwear. <laughs> no chance. <laughs> Almost 60% of deaths when jumping or falling into cold water involve what we've just seen. So, to stay safe, enter the water slowly, and if you must jump in, don't do it alone without knowing how you'll get out, and definitely not after a drink. By all means, enjoy water activities, but remember, a dip at 12 degrees is no joke. After the summer break, the nation went back to work and back to school. As the kids dug out their pencil cases, there was something parents ought to have been looking out for too. 
headlights do the rounds as term begins, and in some cases they're becoming resistant to over-the-counter treatments. So try to catch them early by knit combing wet hair regularly. But for the teens and 20-somethings amongst us, there was something far more serious to be aware of. Whether it's a nasty souvenir you've picked up on holiday or too much bed hopping at the start of the university term, September is peak season for sexually transmitted infections. But this year, it was the longer term trend that really got doctors talking. Rates of STIs like gonorrhea hit a peak in the 1970s, as free love and the contraceptive pill meant lots of people having lots of unprotected sex with lots of partners. But the arrival of HIV in the 1980s increased safe sex practice and rates fell. But certain STIs are on the rise again, and it's the under 25s that we are most worried about. That's why I'm on the way to Manchester. It's home to four universities. It's got 85,000 students and a whopping 40% of the population is 25 or under. So it's the ideal place to find out what people are doing to keep themselves clear of the clap. I'll be meeting this lot. They're local students and have gamely volunteered to join me for a Saturday morning debrief after a fairly typical night out. Any shenanigans? Did anyone have any exciting encounters with anybody else? You can tell me. You can tell me. No? No? <laughs> Quite well behaved for once. Yeah? <laughs> do you think about sexual health when, when you're out, or, or do you think about just having a good night out? No, oh, you're definitely, you're like, no. <laughs> Would you worry about sexually transmitted infections? Oh, yeah. I'm not yeah. worried yeah. About, yeah. about the big C about chlamydia, because it's, yeah. you know, We've all been told, like, you don't know you've got it for a really long time and then yeah. it can, like, hit you, yeah. you could be infertile, so... A lot of yeah. us do think about it. There are some guys who are... or girls who are in complete denial or who are too embarrassed to access services or talk about oh, it. Yeah, yeah. 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 I know a few people who maybe, like, they leave it until it's too late. Like, they kind of... Not too late, obviously, they can still get treatment, but kind of, like, they have a feeling, but they put it off because they have, like, that feeling that they, they are going to get bad news. And, I, and, uh, I know a guy and he's had a lot of partners and has <laughs> never ever been tested and never uh, used a condom. That's unattractive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think people sometimes always think, oh, I'm at uni, it's fine. Yeah. And also they kind of joke like, about oh, it. I can get treated and so it doesn't really matter if I get it. Yeah. yeah. If people think they can definitely get treated, they're mistaken. Since 2012, diagnoses of gonorrhea have increased a whopping 53%. Half of cases are in the under-25s, and in 2016, a very scary strain of this bacteria came to our attention. Professor Val can tell us more. One of the things that's very worrying about gonorrhea at the moment is that we are seeing um, resistance developing in the common antibiotics that we treat with. When gonorrhea is grown in a Petri dish, it forms a brown layer like this. The white dots here contain the two antibiotics doctors use to treat gonorrhea. You can see quite there's nicely no where, the where there's no gonorrhea in the middle yeah. because it's killed it. it. means those antibiotics will work in the patient. These clear red areas around both antibiotics are what we hope to see. But this is a lot more concerning. What's worrying is that we're seeing a pattern like this. So we see the two antibiotics, but we see that one of them now... It's still teeming with gonorrhea. It's still it? teeming. So that antibiotic is not affecting the gonorrhea. It's been called super gonorrhea because it's resistant. So it's a very, very worrying trend. By the start of the 2016 term, 48 cases of super gonorrhea had been confirmed. But this will likely just be the tip of the iceberg. You know the phrase, if you can't be good, be careful. And in a world of super resistant sexually transmitted infections, playing it safe is definitely the best bet. Because let's face it, there's nothing quite like an STI to deflate your sex life. Antibiotic resistance is a serious concern, with lots of infections no longer responding to the drugs doctors have available. So we all need to play our part in beating this. We should never demand antibiotics from our doctor. And if we are prescribed them, always finish the course. A 
snapshot of the last week in September reveals that the government was notified of 78 diagnoses of mumps, 86 of tuberculosis and 118 of whooping cough. Winter temperatures finally arrived in November. It's well known that more people become ill in colder months, but the most recent stats reveal extra winter deaths are the highest they've been for 15 years. We expect things like flu to get us, but on freezing dark days, we can suffer from something most of us only think about when we're hot. In winter, dehydration kills. The team at Portsmouth want to show me how this happens. I'm warmed up to a lovely 24 degrees. <laughs> before being stuck in the chiller cabinet. How many degrees is this? Uh, it's 12 degrees Celsius. Hmm. This is like going in the fridge. A thermal camera shows how my body reacts. Extremities like my fingers appear blue as they chill immediately. I'm sending blood away from the surface of my skin and deeper into my body to keep it warm. But there's a side effect. More blood squeezed into my core makes my blood pressure soar. The body senses that and then starts to offload the fluid that's coming from the periphery. And it's called cold-induced diuresis. And anybody who's stood at a bus stop or stood at the side of a football match and got cold will know that. To cut blood pressure, water is filtered out of my blood and sent to my bladder. This is exactly why, if we're toasty warm, then step out into freezing temperatures, we can suddenly need to pee. Our bodies only stop producing extra urine when blood circulates normally again. And for me, that means cycling. Now I feel very hot. Smell your fingertips. Yeah, they're cold. It took 15 minutes cycling to reverse this effect. That's a fair amount of effort. All your fingertips are now vasodilated. They're all warm now. Even just a chilly draught can lead to this cold dehydration effect, which can increase your risk of stroke, heart attack and blood clot, especially in the elderly. So the best thing to do to prevent it is to keep warm and stay well hydrated. And if you do catch a chill, then get those muscles pumping. As 2016 drew to a close, some traditional seasonal ailments returned. Unusual food in large amounts can bring on festive attacks of heartburn and bloating. And I see a lot of constipation in people who are too embarrassed to use the loo at the in-laws. So don't be shy, drink plenty of water and keep active if you want to avoid the dreaded jingle bowels. When our review of what we caught when in 2016 began, I wanted to find out what a month of alcohol could really do for my liver. 6.0, which, right. which is fine, I'll yeah, right. which is fine. 10 million of us tried it in 2016. So if you're planning on doing it in the year ahead, is it worth the pain? Do you have to them? them. My guinea pig friends and I all had our livers scanned, our bloods tested, and then embarked on the really tricky bit. Staying off the drink for a full month. Week one of no alcohol. Generally been going OK. Second week. I haven't had a huge amount of social activities going on, so it hasn't been that difficult. I've been eating a lot of sweets. I've still got a couple of weeks to go, so let's see how I am. Third week. Um, still on that orange and lemonade vibe. Four weeks without alcohol are finally over, and I'm looking forward to seeing the results. So, we've all made it through the month. We've had our tests redone, and what better place to find out our results than a trip to the pub? So, was being on the wagon worth it? I just found that Monday mornings, um, really good just to find really awake. Generally you felt much much better, concentration levels were uh, improved. I think it's just been a little bit of a life change really to break in the habits. We felt good but did it do us any good? Dr Gautam Mehta has got our scores. So in terms of the liver results how did we all do? It's very interesting about half of you had an improvement in your liver fibre scan score um, which is the scan that you had as, as we started. 
two people were slightly above normal, borderline, I would say, and both those people had, a, had an improvement to the normal range. Actually, your scan got quite a lot better, it's fair to say. It's fair to say, yeah, from a month off. My liver score fell from six to three, which is a great result. And there's more good news. Almost everyone had an improvement in their blood pressure, nine out of 10 of you, which is pretty impressive. A couple of people that had borderline cholesterol levels also came down to normal. A lot of you said you slept better, and almost all of you lost weight. Between the whole group, we lost two stone in just one month. From my perspective, it's more about changing your lifestyle for the long term, really. And if Dry January gives you the insight to do that, then it's got, it's got to be a good thing. So overall, yeah. good-looking liver, good numbers, better, better night's sleep. Better sleep and concentration, yeah, it's fantastic. And more money in our pockets. Sticking to dry January can really help repair your liver and enhance your overall health and well-being. So that's something that's surely worthy of cracking open the bubbles, even if it is just sparkling water. Hey. Looking back at what we caught when could empower us all to make better decisions and stay fit and well. Here's to our health for the year ahead.